Uh, you see the title today, And the Angels Said to Her. As we approach uh, Christmas, I'd like to start actually this week uh, and complete ne with next week uh, five things that the angel Gabriel uh, predicted or foretold concerning Mary's son. And so let's just start off taking a look at the uh, first three. We'll take a look at the last two next week. We read in Luke chapter 1, in the sixth month, this is the sixth month of uh, Elizabeth's uh, pregnancy with John the Baptist. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Or Yeshua, meaning Yahweh is our help, or Yahweh is our salvation. And uh, here we go as we take a look at the first uh, three predictions uh, that the angel Gabriel gave to Mary about her son. Luke chapter 1, verse 32. Number one, he will be great. Number two, he will be called the Son of the Most High. And number three, and the Lord will give to him, the Messiah, Mary's son, the throne of his father, David. The word great uh, is the word mega in the original language. We know what mega is, right? We have like mega white sharks, you know, or, or uh, what do we call them? Um, great whites? Great is mega. So we have all these words uh, or associations with great. What is greatness, though? What really is greatness? Uh, it's all relative, I think. You can have a great ball player, right? You can have a great runner. You can have a great mind. You can have a great Thanksgiving recipe. Amen? Great recipe, yeah. But great is only relative to something that is not as great. Amen? How's this for great? Let's go more behind. The Apostle Paul wrote to Titus, and he wrote in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, at first glance, we can look at this and maybe... Uh, when you have like two people who come to your door with ties on? You ever have two people come to your doors with ties? Raise your hands, have you ever? Okay. And so when they look at this scripture, what they say, well, that is the appearing of God and also the appearing of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that's what they believe because they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. That's a big deal. The only thing is, what's so interesting here is Paul wrote this. Mary's son, Jesus, the Messiah, the, the Christ, this is after his birth, this is after his uh, death, after his burial, after his resurrection, after his ascension into heaven. The church is established. The church is, is going strong. And when Paul wrote this, the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the original language, there's a certain uh, rule, grammar rule. It's used about 250 times in the New Testament. Uh, it's called Granville Sharp's rule. And what this is saying grammatically, is that the great God is Jesus Christ. The great God is Jesus Christ. They're the same person. Mary's son will be great more than any human being could ever imagine. A great God, but also a great Savior, one and the same. Remember John 1, 1, we, we said a lot, we repeated a lot. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, that's before we knew him as Jesus. 100% uh, uh, 
man because of Mary, 100% uh, God because of God. But in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God at the same time. And a little further down, and the Word became, anyone? Flesh. The incarnation. So he came to earth for us, amen? He came to earth for us. I mean, that's pretty great. Actually, um, he is great in the absolute sense, amen? Uh, the second thing that uh, the angel Gabriel told Mary about her son was, he will be called the son of the Most High. Now notice this, because uh, a lot of times this idea of the son of God causes a lot of confusion. He will be called, it's a title, the son of the most God. But before he came to earth, he was God. He was the word of God. And this term in the Hebrew, uh, to be the son of someone, uh, it really points to being, e having equality with the fa your father. That you have the same traits as your father. The son was often used to refer to one who possessed the father's qualities. Remember, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Not just one in thought, and they are one. So this term, the Son of the Most High, in the Hebrew, pointed to the equality of Jesus to being God, a carbon copy of the Father. And this was so uh, well known, especially in the spiritual world, both good and bad realms, in the spiritual realm. Demons would repeat this statement on many occasions. In Mark chapter, I believe it's five, of the Gerasene demoniac, uh, when Jesus came to him, uh, he fell down before Jesus, and the demons crying out with a loud voice and said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high? Another example is in Acts chapter 16. Uh, as Paul was going around uh, the place of prayer, this is in uh, Philippi, uh, there was a girl, slave girl, who had a spirit of divini uh, uh, divination. Div divination, thank you, divination, divination. And brought her owners a lot of fortune telling. So what she did was she followed, let me back up, she followed Paul and said, crying out, these men are the servants, and they're servants of Jesus, they're, they're Christians, they're disciples. These men are servants of the Most High God because they're followers of Jesus, amen? Who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Well, who are they talking about? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And salvation is the very name of Jesus. Yes, you are. So the spiritual realm actually knew of this also. It makes sense when we take a look at Philippians 2, verse 6. Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form, in the very essence of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped or seized or clutched or held on to. And he made himself nothing. He came to the star. This is the incarna incarnation. This is what we're celebrating this Christmas. So Jesus is Mary's physical son, 100% human, but also the son of God, 100% God. Because in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh. And thus we celebrate the incarnation of, of God himself. We celebrate Christmas. Back to verse 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of God. That was number two. And number three, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Now we're looking to the physical uh, humanity through the line of David. And we read, God will give him, the Messiah, Mary's son, the throne of his father, David. God had a covenant with David, an agreement in 2 Samuel 7, 16. God said uh, to David, your house, your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever, says King David. 
And this implies that the, that the son Mary is about to bear and to conceive is the very Messiah, especially in this case. Psalm 110, it is a prophetic psalm. It is a psalm of or by David himself. And it starts out, the Lord said to my Lord, the Lord said to my descendant, Lord, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies your footstool. When Jesus was on earth, he spoke to the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, about his deity, about his being God, to having that God stature 100% while still being 100% human. And he raised the question about this verse to them because, see, they had no answer for him. Because King David would never call just a human descendant his Lord. It doesn't work that way. See, they were waiting strictly for a physical human being. Let's see what happens. In Matthew 22, now the Pharisees were gathered together and Jesus asked them a question concerning Psalm 110. Saying, what do you think about the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David, because they're only looking at the physical descent from David, which Jesus was. Next verse, then Jesus said to them, how is it then that David, in the spirit, meaning when he wrote Psalm 110, it was led by the spirit of God just like all scriptures, inspired by the Spirit of God, writing this prophetic psalm. So Jesus said, how is it then that David in the Spirit calls the Messiah Lord? Saying, and quoting Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under I'll put your enemies under your feet. See, Jesus is not just 100% man from the, line of, from the line of David through Mary. He is 100% God. And Je Jesus asked, and then he said, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And we read that no one is able to answer uh, a word to Jesus from that point on. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. He will be great, the angel Gabriel said. He will be called the son of the most high. And he will sit on the throne of his physical ancestor, David, through lineage. Man, this is such a big deal. This is such a big deal. Because it's deeper and it's wider, it's more intricate than any human mind could ever conceive. Although in essence, Jesus was in form God. He made himself nothing in the incarnation. Becoming a man, being born to humble himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And as a fulfillment, we read, therefore, God has, as we're looking as a church, Jesus says, he's died, he's been buried, he's arisen, he's gone into heaven. And at this point right now, and therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Because he's on the throne. Again, this is such a big deal as we celebrate Christmas. This was so, uh, 
such a big deal that even the Apostle Paul wanted Christians, he wanted disciples like us to really get it. He wanted us to understand. In Ephesians chapter 1, I'll just read part of it. Paul writes I, to the church, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. The angel Gabriel said, he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. He will sit on the throne of his father, David. Jesus, whose name is Salvation. Jesus, 100% man. Jesus, 100% God. And as the angel proclaimed, he proclaimed the deity of Jesus. He proclaimed the humanity of Jesus. As Mary's son, human. As the son of God, divine. Uh, there's such a familiar uh, verse, scripture, that we use, the very scriptures uh, during Christmas time, as we well should, from Isaiah chapter 9. It just... I don't know, to me, it just makes so much more sense now. This is written approximately 700 years before the birth of Jesus. For to us, a child is born of Mary. For to us, a child is born human. To us, a son is given from the Father. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And the government shall be upon the Messiah's shoulder. And the name, his name, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And it closes with, and the zeal of the Lord God himself will accomplish this. As we've said a few times already, and all God's people said,